I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. This morning, Ephesians chapter 4, we've been working our way through this wonderful book of Ephesians over the last, I guess, seven months. And we made it last week to the halfway point. We finished chapter 3. And it's not just the middle of the book in terms of uh, the chapter count, but it is the great turning point, the great transition in the book of Ephesians. It's right here at the start of chapter 4. The first three chapters are mainly doctrinal. They describe our glorious salvation. They describe all the privileges that are ours in Christ. They, they describe how, how great it is to be part of the church. Um, and then you get to the first word of chapter 4, and it's the word, therefore. Therefore. Um, and this signals a shift from doctrine to practice. Um, here, uh, there's all this truth. There's three chapters worth of all this glorious theology. And therefore, because of all this truth, here's how you should live. Here's how you should practice the Christian life. Here's how you should live it out. Um, and so these last three chapters, chapters 4 through 6, they cover all aspects of practical Christian living. And uh, we actually see the same pattern in Paul's other letters sometimes, especially in the book of Romans. Uh, for example, in Romans you have 11 chapters of theology, and then you get to the first verse of chapter 12 of Romans, and he says, Therefore... Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. You see similar things in, in Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, I think, where Paul makes this transition from, from doctrine to practice. And, and so I'm going to eventually talk about this first verse of chapter 4 today. Uh, but I'm going to spend some time uh, first just, just kind of giving an introduction to this second half of the book of Ephesians because it is so different than the first half of Ephesians. Um, so, so we're going to start with just a quick tour. Um, you know, I, I said that it's all practical living topics ahead. So, so what are these topics uh, that we'll be looking at, Lord willing, in the coming Months, so you can follow along in your Bible if you'd like. Uh, but but what's what's ahead in these last three chapters? Well, the first topic uh, that we'll have to deal with, Lord willing, next Sunday is is the topic of unity, unity in the church, uh, the unity of the Spirit, and the bond of peace. So that takes us down through verse six of chapter four. Then after that, it just naturally goes into talking about spiritual gifts and the role of gifted people in the church. And, and then beginning at verse 17, there's a general exhortation to holiness, to um, putting off the old man, putting on the new man. Um, and then uh, that goes, the general stuff kind of goes down through verse 24. And then beginning at verse 25 of chapter 4, things get very specific with very detailed examples of what godly Christian living looks like. And um, so in chapter 4, verse 25, he talks about telling the truth rather than lying. Um, verses 26 and 27 are about handling our anger appropriately. Uh, verse 28 about stealing, or not stealing, but rather working. And then you've got a verse about our talk. You know, no rotten words, but instead edifying words. A verse about not grieving the Spirit in verse 30. In verse 31, a list of sins uh, that we should not do to hurt other people. And then the next verse, there's a list of virtues we should do instead of doing those sins against people. Uh, then that brings us to chapter 5, and we've got a couple of verses there about imitating God. Um, then some verses about sexual immorality, filthy talk, and greed. Um, then a general exhortation, chapter 5, verse 6 through 14, there's a general exhortation about walking in the light rather than in the darkness. 
Uh, then a couple verses um, at verse 15, talking about redeeming our time. Uh, you're probably familiar with those verses. Then after that, it's a command to be filled with the Spirit rather than controlled by drunkenness. Um, then a couple of interesting verses about singing and thankfulness. Then we have a new section uh, begins in the middle of chapter 5 that, that deals with our, uh, the relationships that we're in in our life and particularly submitting to authority in those relationships. So there at the end of chapter 5 we have the, uh, the, the clearest passage in the whole Bible dealing with marriage. Uh, how husbands are to act to their wives and vice versa. Uh, so the, so the husband-wife relationship, then beginning in uh, chapter 6, we have the, the, the child-to-parent relationship. And uh, then after that, the, the relationship between slaves and masters. Uh, then you get to the middle of chapter 6, and there's that famous section about Christian warfare and, and putting on the whole armor of God. I suspect that'll take us a while to get through. And, and then a few verses uh, exhorting us to prayer. And, and then just a couple verses at the very end of, of more some personal messages uh, from Paul. So uh, that's, that's the preview of coming attractions in these uh, these next three chapters of Ephesians. I hope you can see it's all about different aspects of Christian living, our growth in grace, our pursuit of personal holiness. Or to use the more theological word, it's about sanctification, of how we become more and more like the Lord Jesus. Um, so I hope you're excited. I hope you're excited about what's ahead uh, in these next three chapters. Some of you are just going to enjoy the variety. You know, it's like there's a new topic every week or two uh, that we're dealing with. And, and so there's just so many areas in which we have the potential to really grow uh, in these coming months. There's such potential for the Lord to deal with us, our needs in different areas and really make progress. So that's exciting. Um, and I mean, some of you just really like practical preaching. You like, you like the idea of somebody telling you, don't do this and do do this. And, and so there's going to be a fair amount of that uh, coming up, I'm sure. Uh, so I hope you're looking forward to this, these uh, studies. Um, but, but I'll tell you honestly, as a pastor, I approach these chapters with, with a lot of feelings of caution, carefulness, concern. And, and the reason for that is that, that this content here, uh, what we see in the second half of Ephesians, these are the main areas in which Christians get into trouble. It's not, it's not so much the first half of Ephesians, all that glorious theology, that doesn't usually cause trouble. But it's, it's this practical stuff. It's the personal pursuit of holiness, how we view sin and righteousness and stuff. That's where there's more issues, there's more trouble spots, there's more ways to get off track. And um, so I have concerns as we move this direction. And, and so while we're in kind of introduction mode today, uh, I'm going to take I don't, maybe 15 or 20 minutes and just go through um, some warnings, um, some talk about the seven most common trouble spots, the pitfalls uh, related to the pursuit of personal holiness. Uh, things, th these are all things that I've fallen in, that I've gotten in trouble in. They're things that I see you guys fall in sometimes. And, and so I just, before we plow into these four chapters, I just want to put it out there uh, so that we might be, uh, might be on guard against any of these dangers. So pitfall number one is a big one. Uh, it's a big one. It's the danger of undermining the gospel by the way that you think about matters of personal holiness. Brethren, we are saved by grace alone. Um, we're, we're saved through faith. We're saved by resting in the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
alone. We are clothed with Christ's perfect righteousness. We are accepted with God 100% because of Jesus. There is no condemnation for all that are in Christ Jesus. We are not saved by our good works. It's our, our obedience, our obedience is not what makes God love us from day to day or love us a little more from day to day than He did the day before. And, and you've got to be absolutely clear about those gospel realities um, or, or you can get terribly confused. It's like, like on the one hand, the doctrine of justification is clear and glorious. Our standing with God um, in Christ through the gospel. And on the other hand, you have our, the doctrine of sanctification, our, our growth in grace, our pursuit of holiness. This is mainly what we're going to be looking at the next, the next few months. And the danger is that we don't keep these two truths separate in our minds. The danger is they get too close together and they start getting tangled up in our minds and then all kinds of confusion uh, ensues. I mean, you end up thinking somehow that you're saving yourself by being holy enough and you set the standard of what you think holy enough is. And, or or you, uh, you start trusting in your own obedience somehow rather than, than trusting 100% in the perfect obedience of Christ. You see how that undermines the gospel. Um, you, you, uh, and then every time you struggle with some sin, you start, you start doubting your own salvation. It's like, well, if I, if I have got this problem, I must not even be a Christian at all. And, and you just see it's this unstable kind of chaos because, because you're not keeping clear the difference between justification and sanctification. And, and of course, the devil really wants us to get it all tangled up and confused and he wants to destroy the gospel. He wants to dishonor the Lord Jesus. He wants to turn grace into works in our, in our minds and leave us miserably confused. And so I'm warning you about that in advance. As we talk a lot about, about our obedience, of our, our behavior as Christians, don't ever lose sight of the glorious gospel that saves us and that, that ensures that there is no condemnation for all that are in Christ Jesus. That's pitfall number one. But there's a ditch on the other side of the road from that that's also trouble. Pitfall number two is, is that of failing to strive after holiness at all. See, people realize the first problem and, and, and they say, Whoa, I don't want to undermine the gospel. I don't, I don't want to become legalistic. We all know legalistic is a bad word. You say, I don't want to be that. And, and, so, and, and they say, you know, I, I want to exalt grace. I, I want it to be all about love. I want to celebrate my liberty in the new covenant, right? And, and in their attempt to exalt grace and liberty, their attitude toward pursuing holiness becomes really casual, really dismissive. Like, you know, they don't see it as important to be striving vigorously for personal purity and righteousness uh, before God. Maybe it goes so far they actually smugly despise those Christians that seem to worry a lot about holiness stuff. It's like those people just don't understand grace, I guess. Well, that, that's wrong. That's, that you've gotten ensnared in something. Uh, folks that are ensnared in this, they, they'll talk a lot about being led by the Spirit. We need to be led by the Spirit. And that is true. We do need to be led by the Spirit. But let's be clear. The Holy Spirit that leads us is the same Holy Spirit who inspired all these very detailed commandments to be written in our Bibles. I mean, these commandments are here so that we will study them and understand them and obey them diligently. That's important. That's not some bad legalism thing. That's very good. And in fact, the Bible says this thing of obedience is one of the main ways we show our love for Jesus. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What are his commandments? Right here, right here in his inspired word. 
And so if, when you love Christ, you're going to humbly submit yourself to His authority and, and you will endeavor with all your might to obey whatever He says to do. We're supposed to be aiming at perfection. We're supposed to be pursuing holiness wholeheartedly. That's not anything bad. That's good. That's commanded. <coughs> Pitfall number three is emphasizing holiness in one area while ignoring obvious sin in other areas. See, guys, we've all got our own pet issues, don't we? We've got certain issues that we're real sensitive to, and, and, and we're sensitive to that kind of sin, and it really bugs us, and it, and, and it bothers us that these, these other Christians over here don't care as much about this sin as I do. And, and the danger is that we fixate on certain things, especially more minor things, and we miss these really big issues out here uh, where we've got big problems. I was thinking there in, in James chapter 2 where he talks about he that's guilty of, of, of breaking the law in one point has, has broken the whole thing. And the idea is that it's, he says it's the same God who's given one command as he's given all the other ones. And so they're all under the same authority. They're all important. We don't get to pick and choose. Remember how Jesus criticized the Pharisees for this. He says, look, you guys are just obsessed with certain commandments. They were, it was all about the Sabbath keeping, wasn't it? It was all about tithing just right. And he says, you guys are missing the weightier matters of the law. He says, you're, you're all about these little things over here, but you're missing these really huge things on the other side completely. And so, and so that's how you see this snare come up. Somebody's all worried about this certain thing, but they're missing giant issues. The issue of love is the most obvious thing. I mean, we talked about that in past weeks. I mean, are you loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your whole person? Are you fervently loving the brethren from your heart, Lord? It's those that are, that are all worked up about one issue often are missing issues of love that are really big. How about the issue of joy? Uh, I mean, it's like nobody feels convicted for being joyless, but it's a sin not to be joyful if the Bible says to rejoice always. How about the issue of faith? Um, we're supposed to actually believe everything that God says in the Word, and that is a big job. There's a lot of stuff there to to believe, to walk in faith, and and so and so as we as we focus on a particular issue here or there over these weeks, let's keep in view all the big picture of of all that God tells us to do, and particularly these these biggest issues of. Obedience. I mean, the only way we can stay balanced is, is by looking at the whole Bible, everything God says, and seeking to grow in all of it, not just our little favorite areas, but grow in the whole thing. Pitfall number four is making much about matters that are not clear in Scripture. Making too much about things the Bible is not clear on. You know, there is no Bible verse forbidding the consumption of alcohol. In fact, in fact, Jesus, Jesus did drink wine and make wine. And, uh, and yet for some people, that issue of teetotalism is a hallmark of holiness in their view. For millions of American Christians, it's that way. And yet it's something that the Bible does not directly teach at all. Uh, likewise, there's no verse forbidding certain styles of music. There's no verse that says that guys have to have a Baptist haircut. Um, there's, there's no verse that says you have to homeschool your children or whatever. Now, we have to make, we have to make decisions in our lives about all these matters. And, and not every choice people make is the best choice. Sometimes people choose really poorly uh, in these areas. Um, but, but when the Bible is not really clear about something, you're going you're gonna to find some Christians are going to view it differently. They're going to apply the principles of Scripture differently. They're going to come to different conclusions in their own life, and we got to be okay with that. My mother-in-law, my dear mother-in-law, is a holy woman. She has walked with God over 50 years. And if you knew her... Uh, better you would you would 
you would find out that she has a list of, of, of sort of personal convictions about holiness. And, and probably none of you would agree with a lot of the stuff uh, that's on her list that she thinks she needs to do in order to please, please the Lord. And, um, and, and one thing she says is, if the Holy Spirit has shown me these things, why doesn't everybody have to do all the same things that I do um, in, in terms of my personal convictions? We're talking about stuff that's not in the Bible at all. Um, how do you answer that kind of question? What, why would the Holy Spirit require something of, of somebody and not of somebody else? Well, I think the best answer is found there in Romans chapter 14, um, where, where it's clear that people in that church in Rome, some of them had different convictions and different practices than other people in the church. And whenever Paul writes to them, his goal is not to get everybody to act just the same as everybody else. Instead, his burden is to have everyone following their own conscience, being convinced in their own mind of what, they, what they're doing, and, and to do whatever they do as unto the Lord, to have an attitude of worship in it, as unto God, and especially that they would all treat one another, especially the ones that differ from them, they would treat those brethren with, with respect and love. Making too much about matters not clear in Scripture. That's a fourth danger. Pitfall number five, proudly comparing yourself to other people. Uh, I mean, you can, you can sit there and spend a whole sermon uh, just thinking about, you know, how you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good at this thing that the preacher's talking about, but those other people over there, they really need to hear this. They really need to change over there. You're comparing yourself to them and, and justifying yourself. Uh, there's a warning that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians 10. That I think of sometimes he... He says, he warns about those who measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. It's all, it's all co comparing amongst themselves, comparing to their own standard. Beloved, your standard for holiness is not the average Christian you know. It's not, it's not enough to say, well, I'm doing about as well as most Christians. That's not our standard. Your standard is not your pastor, even. It's not to say, well, I'm doing as well as that guy. But, but your standard is the Word of God. In fact, your standard is God Himself. We're supposed to imitate God. We're supposed to be holy as He is holy. And so our, our standard is really high. Even if you're doing really well at, at, at something that we're talking about in these coming months, you can probably still excel still more in that area. That's what Paul does to the Thessalonians. He says, you guys are doing good in this, but I exhort you to excel still more. You can do even better um, in that. Pitfall six. Uh, this is an important one. And, and that is despairing over slow growth in a certain area. Uh, we all have battles against certain sin issues in our life that that take much longer to win than dealing with other sin issues. Um, that's just reality. I think that's true for every single Christian. I think we'd all say that. There's some things, for me, are especially tough. Maybe there's some things that, that you deal with not just once in your life, but, but it comes back. Maybe there's some kind of ugly relapse, and it's like, oh, I've got to deal with this again. I've got to repent of this again. There are times that can just be weeks that are frustrating, uh, fighting against something. The older preachers, uh, they follow the, the language of the King James translation there in Hebrews 12.1, and they, they refer to those kinds of sins as besetting sins. Maybe you've heard that term, besetting sins. It's, it's the, the particular sin that, that is most entangling to you in particular. It's most difficult for you to deal with. Um, you know, the Bible acknowledges very clearly the, the reality of remaining sin in Christians' lives and the, and the difficulty of the fight against remaining sin. We should not be surprised if the fight is hard sometimes and frustrating sometimes. Uh, 
Um, Proverbs 24, verse 16, I, I quote often, the righteous man falls seven times and rises again. It says, the righteous man falls seven times. Yep, but he keeps rising again by God's grace. Um, the Lord Jesus in his model prayer uh, that's, that's meant to be prayed daily. Give us this day our daily bread. He says in that prayer, Father, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. It's like every day we're confronting our, our past failures and looking ahead and asking not to be tempted in the future. Um, James uh, in his epistle, he says we all stumble in many ways ways. We all stumble in many ways. Uh, John in his epistle says, say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 describes a real fight between uh, the spirit within us and our flesh over matters of obedience. So, so the fact that there's difficulty, that there's struggle, that there's a fight uh, should not surprise us. So please do not despair. Do not despair uh, when you're struggling with something difficult. I mean, that <laughs> despairing is exactly what the devil wants you to do. Um, instead, the path to victory is always a path of faith. It's a path of believing what God says about, about who you are and, and about the power of the Spirit uh, in your life, trusting that, that by God's help, through God's promises, you will be able to grow in that tough area, even the areas where progress seems slow. Don't despair, but believe. Trust the Lord. You will make progress and, and get the victory in the end. Seventh, last pitfall to talk about is, is just being content with mere words and feelings rather than long-term change. Uh, I mean, some of these upcoming studies in Ephesians uh, that we're going to be talking about, they're going to expose needs in your life. And, and you're going to listen to the message and, and, and start thinking, wow, I do have a problem there. You know, I'm not obeying the Lord. I'm not really obeying that Bible verse like I should be. I, I've got something to change. I've got something to repent of there. Now, maybe you even tell somebody else afterwards. Maybe even tell the preacher, you know, thank you for that uh, good convicting message. You know, it's that sort of thing. Well, that's all fine. Just don't stop there. Don't stop there by just feeling some feelings or saying some words. You know, it's, that's not enough. The big question is, will you actually repent? Will you actually repent of that thing? Will you actually turn? Will you actually change? Will something be different in that area? Not just for a week and a half, like it's often the case, but permanently. That's what the Lord wants for you. Um, in, in these studies here. That, that's what's going to make the difference for you between um, growing in real holiness and, and just growing in hypocrisy. Remember, remember what James says in, in James, uh, James chapter 1. He gives that warning about prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. We can delude ourselves by just that feeling something, saying something, but not changing. Um, and he goes on, you know, he says you're like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, but then, but then after looks at himself, he goes away and he forgets what he saw. It's like you saw the problem before, but you go away and now you've forgotten about it. It's out of your mind and it disappears. And he says, become... <laughs> He says, don't become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man is blessed in what he does. So there's a blessing if you become a doer, if you really change, as opposed to just doing something superficial. When the Spirit shows you a need, that is good. That's good. 
capture that thing, do what you need to, to write it down, to pray about it, to confess it to the Lord, maybe strategize with your spouse about it. Boy, I need to change in this. How can I do this? And you talk together about how to grow in that thing. Uh, maybe you make a plan for what needs to change. Maybe it's so good that very first day that you notice a problem to take some kind of real concrete steps toward changing. Now you can't change everything in the first day, but you've made, you take some real steps towards change. Um, don't be content with mere words and feelings. So seven snares, seven pitfalls to be aware of and on guard of as we uh, move through these chapters in weeks to come. So that, that's kind of looking at things in a negative way, I guess, telling you a bunch of bad stuff to watch out for. But, but we actually have a wonderfully positive exhortation here in the first verse of chapter 4. And uh, that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time today. So Ephesians 4 verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. He starts out reminding them that he's a prisoner. We've talked about this uh, in past months. He's been in, a, uh, in, in some kind of incarceration, maybe, maybe five years now uh, the apostle has and he's and so he's reminding them look i i personally am suffering because i have obeyed christ it has cost me a lot to obey christ and so when i'm talking to you guys about obeying christ i have a lot of credibility because i'm i'm sitting here as a prisoner uh, for these very things that i'm encouraging you guys to do and you notice here also his the, the passion of his attitude, it, it's the, my translation, it's, it's I implore you. I, ESV maybe says I urge you. Um, it, it's, he's not just suggesting some stuff. He's not just throwing out some little tips for more successful living or something like that. But he's begging them. He's imploring them. Oh, brothers and sisters, walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. There's a passion here. And, and today I hope you guys feel that passion, not from me, the preacher, but from God Himself. God is calling. God is imploring. Oh, walk worthy. Walk worthy of the high calling with which you've been called. That word walk, let's talk about that for a minute. I think we were familiar with how this is used in the Bible. It just means practical living. Uh, your walk is how you go through life. What, what do you do um, in your days? Uh, elsewhere in Ephesians, Paul uses that term a bunch of times. Uh, you know, in chapter 2, he talks about you know, walking according to this world. Chapter 4, later on, don't walk as the Gentiles do. Uh, chapter 2, he talks about walking in good works that God has prepared. Chapter 5, walk in love. Chapter 5, walk as children of light. Walk as wise men. And so I think we understand walking. It's just how we live. Um, but what about that other word, calling? The calling with which we have been called. Well, calling is the wonderful truth that's, that's taught all through the New Testament that God individually, personally summons every Christian, one by one, he calls them out of the world, out of their sins. He calls them to himself for salvation. At some point, if you're a Christian today, at some point you were lost in your sins and God began calling you. God began working in your heart. God gave you a desire to be a Christian. God gave you faith to trust Him. God gave you a willingness to leave your old life of sin and commit yourself to Christ. So why did you end up being saved anyhow? <laughs> you know, why, why are you a Christian and a bunch of you have lost family members? They heard the gospel too, but they're not Christians. Why are you saved? Uh, why why did you end up a Christian and not all your friends in high school? Was it because you're better than them? We say, no, and obviously it wasn't that I was better. 
Why? It's God called you. God did something for you individually to bring you by His sovereign grace into this salvation, into this relationship with Himself. It's, that's the calling with which you have been called. And, and God called you into a new and glorious life that we've just spent the last six months studying from, from these first chapters of Galatians. It's a life of abundance and abundant salvation of, of all these blessings we've been talking about. You've been brought out of, called out of the worst possible position and taken to the best possible position in the Lord Jesus. You've been called out of spiritual death and taken into spiritual life. You were a child of wrath, but now you're a child of God. You're part of His household. You used to be outcast, but now you're reconciled with God. You're His beloved child, a citizen of His kingdom. You're sealed with the Spirit. Uh, who ministers within you. You're united to Christ. You are, you are part of His body and going to be His bride. Um, and it, because you're in Christ, we've already seen, you're seated with Him in heavenly places. You've, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Imagine this. You who were heading for hell have been called into eternal life, eternal glory, uh, unimaginable things in heaven. And everything in this whole great package of salvation was all paid for you in full by the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ, by His shed blood on your behalf. Jesus paid it all so everything can just be given to you as a free gift of His grace and Love. Christian, that is the calling. That is the calling with which you have been called. And so here in this verse, God is imploring you, walk worthy of your calling. Since God has called you that way, since God has done all that for you, therefore, live in a manner that's worthy. Live a life that is worthy. Live a life that is fitting, that is appropriate for a person who's been blessed so magnificently as you have already been in Christ. In other words, your life should match up to the wonderful truth that you profess to believe. When I went to grade school there in the country years ago, I remember my mom reminding me a few times, uh, Nathan, be careful how you act because you're wearing your dad's name. You're wearing your dad's name. And, and that obviously stuck with me 40-some so years. Um, the thought that I needed to walk worthy of the name rages there in the in in the, the school classroom because my dad's reputation in the community would be damaged if I acted wrong and in the same way brothers and sisters we need to walk worthy of the family name that is upon us we call ourselves Christians we call ourselves the people of Christ and so our life needs to match that. It needs to be worthy of, of His name, all that He's called us into. Really the logic that we see here in, in this first verse of Ephesians 4, it captures in a nutshell um, the, the process of sanctification for people in the New Covenant, for people that are Christians. The process is really simple. Step one is understand who you are now in Christ. Understand uh, your glorious position and privileges and identity now in Christ. And then step two is act like the person that you already are. Act consistent with what God has already done in your life. That new identity that is yours by grace. Know who you are. Be who you are. Um, and that's, that's, why, that's why theology matters. That's why understanding sound doctrine really 
matters. It's so important for practical holiness. One thing leads into another. Doctrine leads into practice. That's what we see here. Um, Paul spends half his letter with all this majestic theology, and then he says, therefore, therefore, because all this is true of you, therefore, here's, here's all this nitty-gritty practical living stuff that you need to follow in order to live it out, in order to show that you really understand all this truth, that you've really internalized this, that this all really is true of you, that this is your new nature. Walk worthy of this great calling uh, with which you've been called. You never need to choose between the two, between good theology and good practice, because the two are going to naturally go together. They reinforce each other. Good theology leads to good practice. And, and we all know precious believers um, who, because you know, they're in a bad church situation or, or maybe they're just lazy, uh, for whatever reason, they haven't learned the truth. They haven't learned the truth about themselves and their salvation. They're still, they're still really shaky and shallow on, on, on understanding who they are in Christ. And, and as a result of that, there's big consequences, isn't there? There's consequences in their practice. There's consequences in, in their experience of the Christian life. They struggle around with stuff that should be easy for them. See, they just don't understand the calling with which they've been called. And so as a result, they're not walking in a manner worthy of it. But let's not just think about other people. Let's challenge ourselves with that, with that same thought, right? I mean, if, if you know... If you know these things, if you know how much God has done for you in Christ, if, if you've been listening to these sermons the last six months through the first half of Ephesians, and this, these just mind-blowing, glorious things we've been talking about, then you know all that. And my challenge to you is now walk worthy of all that truth. Live like a person that really knows all that, really believes all that, is really delighted by, by how much grace and love has been poured upon you in, in your life, just to be able to say, I'm a Christian. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. That means so much. There's so much behind that. Um, and it, it should make you eager now to grow in grace, to grow in personal holiness, to, to excel in, in all the stuff that, that Lord willing will be talking about in the coming months from these, these next three chapters. Um, it's, it's like that line in the Isaac Watts hymn where he says, Love so amazing, so divine, demands, demands my soul, my life my all. God's, God's love for me is so amazing and so divine that it demands from me something. It demands uh, my, my soul, my life, my all. When I, when I see clearly the amazing ways that God has loved me, then, then how can I not, how can I not give Him in return my, my best efforts at at obeying Him, and my best efforts at loving Him, my best efforts at walking worthy of the calling with which I have been called. Amen.